In this video, we are going to start with a quick review of the null space and then go on to talk about the range and fundamental theorem of linear maps. This is our overview slide, which we'll spend about five minutes on before we get to the main part of our video, where we will go over each topic in more details with proofs and more examples. We will start by just reviewing the definition of one-to-one -one or injective functions and onto and surjective functions because those concepts come up later in theorems. So one-to-one -one injective function f from a set A to a set B means that every element of B is mapped to from at most one element of A. For onto or subjective when f goes from A to B, for every element B that is in the set B, there exists an element A in the set A such that f of A is equal to B. Our first main review topic is the null space, sometimes called the kernel, for a linear map T from a vector space V to a vector space W. So the null space of T, denoted null T, is the subset of V consisting of those vectors that T maps to zero. That is, the null space of T are the elements in V such that T of V is equal to zero. In our example, we considered a transformation that maps vectors in R3 to the real numbers, and it's T of Z1, Z2, Z3 is equal to Z1 plus 2Z2 plus 3Z3, and we want to find a basis for the null space. So writing that out, T maps our three-dimensional vector to a real number, and we want to see what vectors, Z1, Z2, Z3, gets mapped to the zero vector. So we set this equal to zero, and we see the condition we have is z1 must equal to minus 2z2 minus 3z3. So in other words, the null space is equal to, or z1, or the first coordinate, is equal to minus 2z2, the second coordinate, minus 3z3, the third coordinate. And here's the second and third coordinates. And then we break this up into a linear combination of z1 and z2, to find the bases as negative 2, 1, 0, and 3, 0, 1. And one of the main theorems when we talked about null space is the null space is a subspace. That is, T is a linear transformation from V to W, then the null of T is a subspace of V. Our new material starts with the range. So again, we have a function T going from V to W. The range of T is the subset of W consisting of those vectors that are of the form TV for some vector V in the vector space V. So in other words, the range are equal to vectors of the form TV, where the vector V comes from the vector space V. And our first example of this is to find the range and a basis for the range of the linear map T from R2 to R3. So T of xy, this is R2, is equal to 2x, 5y, x plus y, and note this is R3. So I write this in this column, vector column format. So t of xy is equal to 2x, 5y, and x plus y. So this is exactly what the range looks like. It looks like 2x, 5y, x plus y. To find our, our basis, I just separate out these, this vector here as to linear combinations of x and y, and we get 2, 0, 1, and 0, 5, 1 as our basis for the range of t. And then we have this theorem here, which is a corresponding theorem here that says the null space is a subspace. Well, our new theorem for the range is the range is a subspace. So if t is a linear map from v to w, then the range of t is a subspace of w. And we have the note that a function is surjective if the range is equal to w. Our next topic will be the fundamental theorem of linear maps. Suppose v is finite dimensional and t is in the space of linear maps from v to w, then the range of t is finite dimensional, and dimension of v is equal dimension null of t plus dimension range of t. Next, we have two other sets of theorems. The first one is a map to a smaller dimensional vector space is not injective. Suppose v and w are finite dimensional vector space such that dimension of v is larger than the dimension of w then no linear map from V to W is injective. A corresponding theorem that says a map to a larger dimensional space is not surjective. So suppose V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces such that dimension of V is less than dimension of W, then no linear map from V to W is surjective. Note these two theorems together mean to have an injective surjective map 
dimension of V has to equal dimension of W. Our last two theorems that are dependent on these two proofs above is for homogeneous systems of linear equations, a homogeneous system of linear equations with more variables than equations has non-zero solutions. And second, the inhomogeneous system of linear equations, an inhomogeneous system of linear equations with more equations than variables, has no solution for some choice of constant terms. That wraps up our overview, so let's go back up to the top and talk about maps and null space. We start with the definition of a function being well-defined. So a function associates every element of a set A with exactly one element of a set B. So here is a picture of what is not a function. Here I have a set A with two elements, these two dots, and I have a set B also with two elements. But this is not a function because this element here is associated with two elements in B, which is more than one element, and this element here is associated with no elements in B, which is less than one element. So for those two reasons, this here does not illustrate a function. For one-to-one -one or injective, to be injective, every element of B is mapped to from at most one element of A. So let's look at this. This is on to because here we have three elements of B and they are mapped to at most by one element of A. This one's mapped to by one element of A, this is mapped to by one, this is mapped to by zero. But that's okay because it's uh, zero elements is still less than one element of A. So this is good, this is on to. Here we have some function that is not on to. This element is mapped to one element of B, and this element of B only has one element of A mapped to it. However, this element here has two elements of A mapped onto it, so it is not on, uh, not one to one. This function again has one, two, three, four elements of B. Each one has exactly one element of A mapped to it, so it is onto. And here we have two elements of B. This element. Here, I mean, this is okay because at most one element, this is zero, so this is good. However, this element has two elements of A mapped to it, so it is not one-to-one. -one. To be on to, for every element B that is in set B, there exists an element A in set A such that f of A equals B. Looking at our examples again, over here this is not on to because we have this element B, but there's no element in A that gets mapped to it. Here, this is onto because we have three elements in B, and every element in B has at least one element in A mapped to it. Right? So there exists an element, and in fact, this point has two elements, but there is at least one element that maps to it. So this is onto. Here, our function is onto because B has four elements, and all four elements have something, some element of A mapped to it. Here again, we have something that's not onto because we have this element here that has nothing from A mapped to it. So this is not onto. And these definitions will come up, actually it's one of the last theorems we had on our overview slide, so it will come up later. Our last video focused on the null space, and we're going to do a quick review. So the null space, also called the kernel of a linear map T from a vector space V to a vector space W, is, called, is denoted null of t, and that's the subset of v consisting of those vectors that t maps to zero. So in other words, the null space are the vectors in v that get mapped to zero. And it's very important you remember that the null space is a subspace of v. I mean, here, the definition, it's obvious, but later when you start working with other theorems, when you're not looking specifically at the definition, you want to remember the null space is a subset of V. We have the example from our last video where T is a transformation from R3 to R. So it maps, and I'm going to show you here in this vector form, it maps a vector in R3 with coordinate Z1, Z2, Z3 to a real number, and it's equal to Z1 plus 2Z2 plus 3Z3. We want to find a basis for the null space. So when we're looking at this null space, we want to know the z1, z2, z3 that gets mapped to zero. So we're going to set our transformation equal to zero. And what that tells us is the condition on z1, z2, z3. It means that z1 
must equal to minus 2z2 minus 3z3. So this is exactly what the null space looks like. It looks like minus 2z2 minus 3z3 for the first coordinate, and then z2 and z3 for the second and third coordinates. Uh, to get the bases, I'm going to break this down. I don't know why, this is just a repeat. You could ignore this one here. But I'm going to break it down so that each coordinate is expressed as a linear combination of z2 and z3. So the first coordinate is minus 2z2 minus 3z3. The second coordinate is 1z2 plus no, 0z3. This last coordinate then is 0z2 plus 1z3. And now I can break this up into two vectors. I have my minus 2, 1, 0 times z2. That's over here. I have my minus 3z3 plus 0z3 and 1z3. So I have that broken up to minus 3, 0, 1, z3, which means the null space is spanned by the two vectors minus 2, 1, 0 and minus 3, 0, 1. You can also see these two vectors are linearly independent because they are not, uh, well, there's only two of them, and they're not scalar multiples of each other. And therefore, these two vectors, minus 2, 1, 0, and minus 3, 0, 1, is a basis for the null of t. And in my last video, I had talked about how the null space tells you something about the function because it tells you how aggressively it wants to map things to a single point. Here you see that the null space is spanned by two vectors. The span of two vectors is a plane. So this transformation collapses an entire plane to a single point. And then we had this theorem here that said the null space is a subspace. So suppose t is a linear transformation from v to w, then the null of t is a subspace of v. In our last video, we proved this theorem, so we will not do it here. And we are ready to go on and talk about the range. For a function, t, that goes from v to w, the range of t is the subset of w consisting of those vectors that are of the form t of v for some vector v and v. In other words, the range of t is equal to tv for some vector v in the vector space of v. Our first example is going to be to find the range of t if t of v is equal to 0 for all vectors in the vector space v. Since the range are all vectors t of v for v in the vector space, then t of v is equal to 0. So the range, then, is going to be equal to the 0 vector. And I apologize, but I have to comment on this transformation, which we saw in our last video when we talked about null spaces. This transformation maps an entire vector space v down to a single point. So when I talked about null spaces telling you something about the transformation, this transformation is like a little black hole. It can map in the entire three-dimensional space to a single point. But we will move on because we're talking about range now. So find the range in a basis for the transformation that goes from R2 to R3, where T is a linear map that maps xy to 2x, 5y, x plus y. So this is the example we saw in our overview slide. I'm just going to make a quick note then. T is part of the subspace of linear maps from R2 to R3. And I'm going to write down what it looks like using this column vector notation. So t of x, y is equal to 2x, 5y, x plus y. So this is exactly what the range looks like. In other words, if I take x equals to 1 and y equals to 1, I get the vector 2 times 1 is 2, 5 times 1 is 5, and then 2 plus 5 is equal to 7. So I know that this vector is in the range of t. Similarly, if I take x equals 2 and y equal to 0, I'll know that 4, 0, 2 is in the range of t. To get a basis now, I'm going to pull out the x's and y's, and I see that I have 2 x, 0 x for the second coordinate, and 1 x for the third coordinate. So in other words, I have 2, 0, 1 times x. And then for y, I have 0 times y for the first coordinate, 5 times y for the second coordinate, and 1 times y for the third coordinate. In other words, 0, 5, 1 times y. So th these two vectors will span the, the range of t.
and they are linearly independent because they are not scalar multiples of each other, and therefore 2, 0, 1 and 0, 5, 1 is a basis for the range of t. Then our third example, suppose d is the differentiation map on polynomials. So d takes a polynomial and it's equal to uh, the polynomial's first derivative. Find the range of d. So I'm just going to make a note now. d is in the vector space of linear transformation from polynomials to polynomials. So d takes a polynomial and it gives back a polynomial. And so d operating on a polynomial p of x will return p prime of x. And so for every polynomial q of x, you can always find a p of x such that p of x is equal to p prime of x is equal to q of x, right? All you need to do is integrate. And therefore, the range of d is going to be the entire polynomial space. Our next example is going to use some of the ideas of onto and subjective functions. That is, for every element b that is in the set b, there exists an element a in the set a such that f of a is equal to b. The example is the differential map d operating on the space of polynomials of degree 5 or less into the space of polynomials of degree 5 or less, defined by d of a polynomial is equal to its derivative. Show that d is not surjective. And I'm going to start as writing d as part of the space of linear functions from p5 to p5. Since this is proving something is not surjective, I'm going to try to come up with an example to show it's not surjective. And I decided to let q of x equal to x to the fifth in p5. Now that we have q of x, what we want to find is some polynomial whose derivative will map to this q of x. So in other words, we want to have a polynomial from our domain in p5, so it takes this form, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed plus a4x4 plus a5x5. Any of these a0, a1, a2, a3, a4, or a5 can be equal to 0. Now when I take d of this polynomial, that's p prime of x, I'm going to get a1 plus 2a2x plus 3a3x squared plus 4a4x cubed plus 5a5x to the fourth, which means for an arbitrary polynomial in p5, when you take the derivative, you're never going to get an x to the fifth term. Hence, there's no p of x in p5 with the polynomial uh, derivative is equal to x to the fifth. And therefore, d is not surjective. Note whether a map is surjective depends not just on the mapping t, but also what vector space into which the polynomial maps. So for example, this p5 to p5 is not surjective, but if we have p5 to p4, then that would have been sub, uh, surjective. In our last video, we had the theorem that said the null space is a subspace. So suppose t is a linear transformation from v to w, then the null of t is a sp subspace of v. Similarly, we have this theorem here about the range. The range is a subspace. If t is a linear map from v to w, then the range of t is a subspace of w. I have written the theorem here, and next we're going to prove it, and we'll start again. t is in the space of linear maps from v to w. To show it is a subspace, there are three things we need to prove. First, that the additive identity is in the range of t and then addition is closed, and scalar multiplication is closed. For the additive identity, first we consider the additive identity in the space t. And because t is linear, that means t of the additive identity is equal to the additive identity in w. And this comes from the theorem that linear maps take the zero vector to the zero vector. Therefore, this zero vector here in w is in the range of t. To show addition is closed, we're going to start with letting w1 and w2 be vectors in the range of t. That is, there exist vectors v1 and v2 such that t of v1 is equal to w1 and t of v2 is equal to w2. If we want to consider now t of v1 plus v2, since t is linear, additivity holds, which means t of v1 plus t of v2 is equal to t of v1, 
plus t of v2, again because of additivity, because it's linear. Now t of v1 is equal to w1, and t of v2 is equal to w2, so we have w1 plus w2. That means v1 plus v2 is what gets mapped to w1 plus w2, and therefore w1 plus w2 is in the range of t. To show scalar multiplication is closed, we're going to start by letting w1 be in the range of t. That is, there exists a vector, which we'll call v1, in the vector space v, such that t of v1 is equal to w1. That is exactly the definition of what it means to be in the range. When we consider now t alpha of v1, because t is linear and homogeneity holds, this will be equal to alpha t of v1. This t of v1, we said, is equal to w1, so what we have is alpha w1. And what we have shown is there is a vector in the vector space V, namely A alpha V1, which is equal to alpha W1 under the transformation. Therefore, alpha W1 is in the range of T. Since we have the additive identity in the range of T, and addition and scalar multiplication are both closed, that means the range of T, which is in the space of linear maps from V to W, is a subspace of W. And again, just like for null space, it's very important to remember that the range is a subspace of W. That's when we're mapping T goes from V to W. The null space is a subspace of V. The range is a subspace of W. And now we're ready to look at the fundamental theorem of linear maps. And the fundamental theorem says suppose V is finite dimensional and T is in the set of linear transformation from V to W. Then the range of T is finite dimensional. And by the way, we know the null of T is also finite dimensional since the null space is a subset of V, which is finite dimensional. But last, our fundamental theorem says that dimension of V is equal to dimension of the null of T plus the dimension of the range of t. And just writing this out, t is in the space of linear transformations from v to w, and we want to show dimension of v is equal to dimension of the null of t, and remember the null space is a subspace of v. Those are the vectors that get mapped to zero, plus the dimension of the range of t, and the range is a subspace of w. Those are the vectors that have something from V mapped to them. I'd mentioned this earlier, but I'm just going to write this down since null of T is a subspace of V. Since V is finite dimensional, then null of T is also finite dimensional. Then we can designate U1, U2 up to Um to be a basis for the null of T. And the dimension of null of T is equal to M then. Since U1, U2 up to Um is a basis for the null of T, then these vectors are linearly independent, or the set is linearly independent, and they can be extended then to a basis for all of V, so not just the null of T, but all of V. And this is just using this theorem that we had on our, we talked about this theorem in our video about bases, so any linearly independent list can be extended to a basis, so every linearly independent list of vectors in a finite dimensional vector space can be extended to a basis. So here is our basis for part of vector space V, the null of T, but now we want to extend it to a basis for V. I needed some more space, so I cleared some things out, but I left that U1, U2 up to UM is a basis for the null of T, which is a subspace of the vector space V, but our U1, U2, UM, since it's a basis for the null of T, it's linearly independent and we can extend it for, to a basis for all of V. So we can extend it by adding additional vectors, V1, V2, up to Vn. And the trick is we want to extend it until the span of these vectors will span all of V, and we also want to expand it in a way that our set remains linearly independent. And when we expand this, what we're going to get is the dimension of V then, is the dimension of null of t, that's these m vectors here, the u1, u2 up to um, plus the n vectors that we need to add in order to get our bases 
for dimension of v. And our strategy then is to show the dimension of the range of t is equal to this n here. That is, we're going to show that the transformation on v1, transformation on v2, up to the transformation on vn will be a basis for the range of t. We will start with a vector v in our vector space v, and we write it generically then as a linear combination of our combined vectors u1, u2 up to um, v1, v2 up to vn. So it's a1, u1, plus a2, u2, plus up to am, um. This much will span the null space, but we want to span more than the null space, so we need to add more vectors, plus b1, v1, plus b2, v2, up to vn, vn. When we transform this vector v, then by linearity and also by additivity, we're going to get a1 t of u1 plus a2 t of u2 up to a m t of u m plus b1 t of v1 plus b2 t of v2 all the way up to b n t of v n. But since u1, u2 up to u m are all in the null space, there are bases for the null space, all of these terms here will go to zero and we'll be left with b1 t v1 plus b2 v t v2 up to bm t vm. And I have that written here in this next line, but this implies that our vectors t v1, t v2 up to t v n then spans the range of t. If we can show these vectors t1, t v2 up to t v n are linearly independent and they span the range of t, then we can claim the tv1, tv2 up to tvn is a basis for the range of t. So this is what we're going to do next. We're going to show these vectors are linearly independent. So to show these vectors are linearly independent, I need to clear some stuff out. I kept that u1, u2 up to um is our basis for the null of t. It's linearly independent and can be extended to a basis with our vectors v1, v2 up to vn. Then we wanted to show then that dimension of the range of t is equal to exactly this n. And we wanted to show that tv1, tv2 up to tvn is a basis for the range of t. And what we showed so far is tv1, tv2 up to tvn spans the range of t. So now we need to show that tv1, tv2, tvn is linearly independent. And so we need to take a linear combination of them and set it equal to zero. So c1, tv1 plus c2, tv2 up to cn, tvn, is equal to zero. If they're linearly independent, the only solution will be the homogeneous solution where c1 equals c2 equals cn equals zero. Since t is linear, we can use our additivity and homogeneity backwards to get this here, this line here, c1, t of v1 plus c2, t of v2 up to cn, t of vn, is equal to t of c1, v1 plus c2, v2 up to cn, vn. We still have it equal to zero. In other words, what we're looking for is the c1, v1 plus c2, v2 up to cn, vn in the null space of t. Since it's in the null space of t, this linear combination here, c1, v1 plus c2, v2 up to cn, vn, can be written as a linear combination of our bases for the null of t. So it can be written d1, u1 plus d2, u2 up to dm, um. Again, this is because u1, u2 up to um is a basis for the null of t. So we can move all these d1s, u1s, and d2, u2 up to dm, um to the other side of the equation, set it equal to zero, but we also know that u1, u2, um, up to v1, v2, vn, this here, this set is linearly independent, which will imply that c1, c2 up to cn, d1, d2 up to dm, must equal to zero. Which means, over here, our c1, c2 up to cn are equal to zero, so c of t v1, c of t v2 up to c n t v n are all linearly independent. Clearing out some space, we were showing that the dimension of the range of t is equal to n, 
We showed that TV1, TV2 up to TVN spans the range of T, and we just showed TV1, TV2 up to TVN is linearly independent, and therefore TV1, TV2 up to TVN is a basis for the range of T, so the dimension of the range of T is equal to N. And finally, what we have then is dimension of V equals dimension of the null space of T plus dimension of the range of T, exactly what we have up here. And I'm just going to remind you at least one more time that the null of T is a subspace of V and the range of T is a subspace of W. Next, we have two sets of two related theorems. The first theorem is about mapping to a smaller dimensional vector space, and it's related to the next theorem, which is about mapping to a larger dimensional space. We will start with mapping to a smaller dimensional vector space. So in other words, dimension of W is smaller than the dimension of V, or dimension of V is greater than dimension of W. So suppose V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces such that dimension of V is less than dimension of W, the no linear map from V to W is injective. I'm going to give you this image that I feel like makes it easy to remember what this theorem is saying, but I'm going to say it's deceptive because here I've drawn uh, V, a vector space with dimension equal to 3, and here I've drawn W, a dimension with vector space equals 2, and I've drawn two vectors here and three vectors in V. But remember, these three vectors, it's the dimension, so these would have to be basis vectors. Here, these would have to be basis vectors, but V is going to have many more elements other than just these three basis vectors because all linear combinations have to be in here. Similarly, here for W, all linear combinations have to be here. But just looking at the basis vectors then, if I want to map these three basis vectors to these two basis vectors in W, remember there ha each of these elements to be well defined has to map to something in W, which means two of them have to map to the same element, which would make it not injective. So no linear map from V to W is injective. Again, this is not the exact picture because I'm, I'm kind of uh, mixing up bases, the number of bases vectors, with the number of elements in V but kind of this is what the picture that helps me remember this theorem. So again, this is just something that helps me remember, but technically we can do a proof to show that this is true and not just rely on this kind of faulty drawing. And we'll start the proof by saying T is in the space of linear maps from V to W, T maps from V to W, and we're given that the dimension of V is greater than the dimension of W. By the fundamental theorem of linear maps, we know dimension of V is equal to dimension of null of T plus dimension range of T, which means dimension null of T is equal to dimension of V minus dimension range of T, which I have written here. And now we know the range of T is a subspace of W, so the dimension of the range of T must be less than dimension of W. So the dimension null of T now must be greater than or equal to dimension of V minus dimension of W. But here, we also know dimension of V is greater than the dimension of W, so that means the dimension of null of T is greater than zero, which means the null of T contains vectors other than zero. It must have at least two vectors mapping to it and possibly more. And remember, the zero vector has no dimension. The zero vector is just the origin, right? If you have a vector space that's spanned by one vector, like the real number line, that has dimension one, like one single line has dimension one. So a single point doesn't have dimension. But here, if the dimension of nullity is greater than zero, that means nullity contains vectors other than the zero vector, and therefore t is not injective. The related theorem about mapping to a larginal dimension space is suppose V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces such that dimension of V is less than dimension of W. The no linear map from V to W is surjective. And again, I have this drawing that helps me remember what this, uh, the results of this theorem is, but you have to be careful with this drawing because it really does not represent, these two here do not represent all the elements in V these three dots do not represent all the elements in W because if 
these were the basis vectors, which is what we're talking about. Dimension is equal to 2, so I drew 2 basis vectors. Dimension equals 3, so I drew 3 basis vectors. I would need to also have all the linear combinations, but like I can't do that. So anyway, here I could do an example, but I haven't. So here, dimension is equal to 2. Here um, our, our w dimension is equal to 3. So, you know, with two basis vectors, there's no way I can hit all of W. And so, so in other words, there's no surjective um, mapping over here. But again, be careful because here we're talking about mapping. When we talk about surjective mappings, we're talking about all the um, elements in V and all the elements in W, not just the basis vectors. So it's a little misleading but it helps me remember, so I thought I'd show you, but be careful with this. We can do a proof, though, to show that this is definitely true. Again, we're going to start with T is one of the linear maps from V to W, and we're given that the dimension of V is less than dimension of W. By our fundamental theorem of linear maps, we know dimension of V is equal to dimension null of T plus dimension range of T. Then solving for dimension range of t, that's going to be equal to dimension of v minus dimension null of t. Remember, dimension of null of t is a subspace of v, so what we're going to have is dimension range of t then will be less than or equal to dimension of v. And since dimension of w is greater than dimension of v, if dimension range of t is less than dimension of v, it's also less than w. So what that tells us is the dimension of the range of t is less than w, so there are things in w that are not in the range of t. So dimension of range of t is less than w means t is not surjective. It's worth mentioning these two theorems together, that a map to a smaller dimensional space is not injective, and a map to a larger dimensional space is not surjective, which means if you want a, a map to be both injective and surjective, the dimension of v must be equal to the dimension of w. Um, for our next two theorems that are related, we're going to also just rely on this. A function is surjective if the range is equal to w. And our first theorem is about homogeneous systems of linear equations, and our second theorem is about inhomogeneous systems of linear equations. So we're going to take a look at those two theorems next. And the theorem we're trying to prove is for homogeneous systems of linear equations, a homogeneous system of linear equations with more variables than equations has non-zero solutions. We're going to use the theorem here that we just proved a map to a smaller dimensional vector space is not injective. First, I want to come over here to the side and just kind of do an example of this theorem, a homogeneous system of linear equations. So I have two linear equations they're both equal to 0, which makes them homogeneous. So my first one is 2x1 plus 3x2 plus 5x3 equals 0. And my second homogeneous linear equation is x1 minus x2 equals 0. I can solve this system of equations by putting it in vector form. So I take my x1 and I have my 2, 1 vector in front of it. I have my x2 with my 3, negative 1 vector. And then my x3 is going to have my 5, 0 vector, and that's going to equal to 0, 0. I can also represent this in matrix form. So I take my coefficients, 2, 3, 5, here, and I take my coefficients of my second equation, which is 1, negative 1, 0, over here. I can also think of this as taking this first vector, the second vector, the third vector here. I multiply it times x1, x2, x3, and I set that equal to 0, 0. So the things I'm going to note from this example is the number of variables here is equal to 3, our x1, x2, x3, or in our linear equation, x1, x2, x3. The number of equations we have is 2. So we're going from a linear transformation from f3 to f2, right? Three variables, x1, x2, x3, we're going to get something in f2. And you can see I can solve this equation this will tell us that x1 is equal to x2, and then x1 is also equal to negative x3. So I'm going to start with saying t maps from v to w, and in particular, I'm going to say it's going to map from an n-dimensional space to an m-dimensional space. When we come over here representing the linear equations, 
we're going to note that this n here is the number of variables, whereas this m here is the number of linear equations. And I kind of have this example to sort of reference. I'm going to use my theorem here, which I'm going to move here, so a map to a smaller dimensional vector space is not injective. In terms of our m and n's, that means t is not injective if n is greater than m. Because here, m, we're going to a smaller space. I want to now change this statement into a statement about number of variables and number of equations. So this says if n, that's the number of variables, is greater than m, which is the number of linear equations, then t is not injective. By our theorem here, we have this theorem about injectivity is equivalent to the null space equaling zero. We have this theorem from our video when we talked about our null space. That's the previous video. It said, let t be a linear mapping b to w. Then t is injective if and only if null of t is equal to zero. So if t is not injective, that means that null of t is not just the zero vector. There are other vectors in there. In other words, there is a non-trivial solution to t of v equals zero which is exactly, and I have to come back up here, I guess I should really box the theorem we're talking about. So I'm going to box this now in blue, and our theorem that we were trying to prove says, a homogeneous system of linear equations with more variables than equations has non-zero solutions. So here we have a transformation with more variables than equations. We showed that if there are more variables than equations, then t is not injective. And if t is not injective, that means this, uh, the null space has more than the, just the zero vector, meaning there's a non-trivial solution to t of v equals zero, the homogeneous equation. The last theorem here is for inhomogeneous system of linear equations, and it says an inhomogeneous system of linear equations with more equations than variables has no solution for some choice of constant terms. The example that I'm going to give you to illustrate this is the system of linear equations. There's three equations, two unknowns. So because I need uh, more equations than variables. So two variables, three equations. So we have 2x1 plus 3x2 equals a. a is not equal to 0 because it's non-homogeneous or inhomogeneous. We have x1 plus 5x2 equals b, where b is not equal to 0. And 5x2 is equal to c, where c is not equal to 0. So I should say a does not equal to 0, b does not equal to 0, and c does not equal to 0. Again, because it's non-homogeneous. I can represent this in vector form. So for x1, I have the vector 2, 1, 0. For x2, I have the vector 3, 4, 5. This should be a 5. Or maybe this should be a 4. Let me change this to a 4, because I seem to like having a 4 here later. And then for our solution vector, we have a, b, c. I can write this in our matrix form, 2, 1, 0, 3, 4, 5 times x1, x2 equals a, b, c. The number of variables then is equal to 2, x1 and x2. These are our variables. Remember, a, b, and c are constants. The number of equations, you can see there are three equations. So our transformation is going from R2. It's going from this vector, x1, x2, into R3, the vector a, b, and c. When I solve this system of equations, let's just let a equal 1, b equal 1, and c equals negative 1. So my matrix then is going to be my 2, 1, 0. My next column will be 3, 4, 5, and my last column will be 1, 1, negative 1. We see if we row reduce this, we get the identity matrix, and this last line will give us the requirement that 0x1 plus 0x2 must equal to 1. And that is impossible. In other words, this system of equation is inconsistent and has no solution. And this is our example we're going to use to illustrate this theorem that says an inhomogeneous system of linear equations with more equations than variables has no solution for some choice of constant terms. In other words, over here I chose the constants a1, a is equal to 1, b is equal to 1, and c is equal to negative 1. There might be other a, b's, and c's other choices where there is a solution, but this theorem says that for some choices there's no solution and that's what we have illustrated here.
So in this theorem, I have t going from v to w, and v is an n-dimensional space, w is an m-dimensional space. This n also represents the number of variables, and m also represents the number of linear equations. We have this theorem here that I've moved here that talks about a map to a larger dimensional space. So in this case, we're mapping from n to m, where n is the number of variables. And here that says there's more equations than variables. So m is greater than n, or n is greater than m. And it's saying that, according to this theorem, when you map to a larger space where m is greater, then your mapping cannot be surjective. In other words, there exists an a1, a2, am in fm, or in w, such that there is no x in fn, such that t of x is equal to our vector a1, a2 up to am. And that's exactly what this theorem is saying, is we have an inhomogeneous system of linear equations with more equations than variables, so more equations than variables, or n is less than m. According to this theorem means it's not surjective, meaning that there's some element in w, or fm in this case, that's not reached by our transformation. To review what we have covered in this video, we discussed null space, range, and the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. We started with reviewing what a one-to-one -one injective map is, which is a map from set A to set B for every element of B is mapped from at most one element of A. We talked about onto and surjective maps, so if F maps from A to B, for every element B that is in set B, there exists an element A in set A, such that F of A <coughs> is equal to B. And we viewed the null space, also called kernel, of a transformation T, which is a linear map from V to W. The null space of T, denoted null T, is a subset of V consisting of those vectors that T maps to zero, that is, the null of t are the elements v such that t of v is equal to zero. And we did this example here in the main part of our video. The next theorem was the null space is a subspace. So suppose t is a linear transformation from v to w. The null of t is a subspace of v. Our new material started with the range. So for a function t mapping from v to w, the range of t is a subset of w consisting of those vectors that are of the form tv for some vector v in the set v. So the range of t are equal to the transformation of v where v is some vector in the set v. We did this example. So if t goes from r2 to r3 and is defined by this map here, t of xy is equal to 2x5y x plus y, this vector here then describes the range of t. We wrote it as a linear combination of the x and y from our r2, and we have the vectors 2, 0, 1, x plus 0, 5, 1, y. So these two vectors, 2, 0, 1 and 0, 5, 1, is a basis for the range of t. Next we have the, the theorem here, which is the corresponding theorem to the null spaces of subspace we have the range is a subspace. If t is a linear map from v to w, then the range t is a subspace w. We have the note a function then is surjective if the range is equal to w. And last, we have the fundamental theorem of linear maps. So suppose v is finite dimensional and t is in the linear maps from v to w, then the range of t is finite dimensional and the dimension of v is equal to dimension null of t plus dimension range of t. We had these other four theorems. These two are related, and these two are related as well. So first, we have a map to a smaller dimensional vector space is not injective. So suppose v and w are finite dimensional vector spaces such that dimension of v is greater than dimension of w. The no linear map from v to w is injective. We have a map to a larger dimensional space is not surjective. Suppose v and w are finite dimensional vector spaces such that dimension of v is less than dimension of w, then no linear map from v to w is surjective. And finally, the last two theorems, homogeneous systems of linear equations, 
with more variables than equations has non-zero solutions. And the last theorem, inhomogeneous system of linear equations, so a non-homogeneous system of linear equations with more equations than variables, has no solution for some choice of constant terms. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.